Now, through the service, we're going to uh, read John's account of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, do, do take it up and read it, or just uh, listen as I read it. Um, but it's on page 905, if you'd like to follow along. We're in the Blue Bibles, large print, 1075. But John, chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And the chief priests and the officers saw him. They they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you have no authority over me at all unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place they called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothes they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill their scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, 
it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Amen. Now this evening we're, we're here to especially ponder these final moments of Jesus' humbled life. And we call that day Good Friday, don't we? But as we read John's account of Jesus' death, perhaps you wondered, well, how, how is this good? We see an innocent man cruelly executed. There's mocking, there's abuse, there's suffering, pain and death. It's a, it's a sobering read. And it comes to that that moment when Jesus speaks his final words, it is finished. Now, was, was that actually just a last whimpering moment of resignation, relief that it's all finally over, a pitiful ending to a bleak point in world history? This world where actually the news is always full of exactly the same, murder, abuse, suffering, and pain. Is that, is that all we've got? Or is there something more? Is there something good and hopeful for us to feed upon as Jesus says, it is finished? That's what we long for, isn't it? Goodness to somehow break through life in the face of death, a light banishing the darkness. And it is dark. Dark because human beings, you and me, we're much like the people around Jesus that Friday 2,000 years ago. Like Pilate, weak Pontius Pilate, a governor, a man who said publicly that he saw no guilt in Jesus, and yet he stood aside and let injustice happen. He watched it and did nothing about it. Much like us, isn't he? Looking at the telly, seeing injustice in our streets, and yet we stand by. Or the mocking soldiers, violent and angry, Flogging Jesus, driving a crown of thorns into his head, beating him with sticks and fists, a deep hatred of God and his ways. Again, how similar we can be, angry towards God and his ways, wishing he had not done or not given us what he has, and then we we let it it spill out in a, a violent tongue or a hand against others. And then we get the religious, the religious Pharisees, the elite of society, baying for blood, And even wanting to change Pilate's sign above Jesus' head to a smug remark about the pitiful Jesus. Proud men, eager to show their virtue to all. Another mirror into our own hearts, our, our deeply proud hearts, where we show off our surface good, but we get angry if our facade is ever brought into question. It's darkness, isn't it? It's not just out there. It's in here. It's in here. Our lives, they can be so deeply far from the life we'd love to have lived. 
We look on the things we've done, the things we keep doing, and it's just painful to see. We'd long to have lived it all differently. We've seen it separate us from, from one another. We've also know deep down this is about God himself. It's against him. Our, our sin is a symptom of our deep rebellion and guilt, a sign of judgment, of wrath sitting over us. As we prayed in our confession of sin, we've gone astray. We've gone our own way. We've done our own thing. We've despised the Lord in his way. The picture is bleak. The darkness of the world and in our hearts can seem too great Can we ever come to God? Can we ever know him? Or is our sin and shame always before us? And is Jesus any different? Is he just swept up in this dark world too? Another casualty. Is there any light? Oh, there is. A beautiful light. And it's in those final words of Jesus. They are not whimpering, but glorious. It is finished. It is finished. These words, they're not of a miserable succumbing to death. They are words of glory, of hope, and of life for us this evening. Come with me, sinners, together. Come with me to the cross of Jesus once again. And may we find grace there. Because here at the cross, the life we should have lived, well, Jesus finished it. The life we should have lived, Jesus finished it. As we've seen, we know there's a life a better life we should have lived. We wanted to have lived. Each day we're wishing we could live. Well, how can Jesus speak a better hope into it? Or is he just like us? Well, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And there's a strange little verse, but notice what is said. To fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst to fulfill the scripture, to finish it, to complete it. There's something amazing going on here. Even in Jesus' thirst, even in his extraordinarily parched mouth, this one window into the suffering of that excruciating death on a cross, even in that, Jesus' life is fulfilling scripture. He's living according to God's will. Now, he's not just saying, oh, I'm, I'm thirsty, so he can tick off a bit of scripture. No, his thirst is obviously real and deep. Instead, each word he said, each act that happened around him, it's all in fulfillment to what God has ordained, what God had said. Jesus, he just can't help but live in obedience to God's will. Now, the scripture he filled was, uh, in speaking of his thirst, was perhaps Psalm 22 or Psalm 69, but both of these speak of someone righteous suffering unfairly. Someone living God's way and yet forsaken and mocked. This little moment that fulfills the scriptures opens up a window into what John means when he says, verse 28, knowing that all was now finished. Knowing that all was now finished. What's that all? Well, it was Jesus' life of utter obedience to God's will every step of the way. He had done what the Father had for him. Back in chapter 8, Jesus had said, He who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Always doing what was pleasing to God. And we see it all the more as he walks towards the cross. His obedience, it intensifies and intensifies. He's not like a child who says, Oh yeah, I'm I'm perfect at painting or or drawing because I can paint painting by numbers. But we all know that there's much more that child can't do. But Jesus isn't like that. He says he always does what is pleasing to God. He always lives to fulfill what God has said. And as he walked to the cross, we see it. He had so many chances to leave this path as we would have done. Back in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter gets out his sword to fight. And Jesus instead uh, commands him to put it back. And he says, shall I not drink this cup that the Father has given me? Then before Pilate, we saw he could have persuaded Pilate to let him go. He even showed Pilate's authority was was from him anyway. Verse 11, you would have had no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Now his obedience to God's will as he walked the darkest path, even in the final moments, he he honors his mother by providing her a son. What obedience, what endurance in doing what is right. He kept to the task. He lived a life of utter integrity. Even to the point of death, verse 30, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
He gave up his spirit. It wasn't taken from him. He laid down his life of his own accords. What a life he lived. He's not like us. Here's someone different. You know, if you've ever wondered who you should follow in life, who you should look to and pursue, look to this Jesus. We know we need someone who isn't like us, don't we? We we get so frustrated with political leaders, say, because we forget they're just like us. We need someone who lived the life we should have lived. Humanity, ever since Adam, took the wrong road, has strayed from God. But here's the new Adam. Here is a leader of utter integrity. Here's a man who walks the path of suffering with a face set like flint. Here's someone who won't let others down when things get tough. He won't drop his morals. He won't drop his standards when it suits him. He won't give in when people are against him. Here is love. Love for God and love for people. It's enduring love. Here we see there is hope. There is a different way of life, a life better than pain, suffering, and selfishness. God's way of life isn't just a pipe dream. It's real. It's tangible. It's witnessed in its perfection that Friday 2,000 years ago. It's the life we should have lived. And Jesus said, it is finished. Now that word for finished, it's a, a word that doesn't just mean end it. Instead, it's a word that means perfected, completed, accomplished. If all was now finished, then Jesus' life he lived is fully complete. It's reached its maximum, its, its zenith, it's the top, it's the pinnacle. It's exhausted all that's required of it. Jesus finished the life we should have lived. It's like getting a 100% in an exam. You just can't do more. You can't get more. His life is, is like the perfect diamond. It's a pure stone, no hint of blemish, then cut to perfection and, and polished so that light glimmers beautifully as it shines through. It's unimprovable. It's unbeatable. The Son has finished the work the Father gave him to do. God has never diminished his holy demands on the human life. And Jesus met them. He did as Adam should have done, as we should have done. But this this finished, it's bigger. It is finished, he says. Not has finished. That little word is, it shows us that what's completed reverberates beyond itself. The ripples spread outwards. This, This work given by God, it was for us. It's a gift for us. It's a life lived for those who should have lived it. It's a righteousness for the shepherd's sheep, for the branches of the vine. It's a gift. It's like royal robes in exchange for dirty rags. A perfect, finished obedience placed on God's people. And God's gift is complete. It can't be added to. We can't perfect it. Other religions will say, if you want to get to God, you you need to bring gifts to appease God. You've got to work your way towards him, like trying to take steps up an endless ladder. But not Christianity, not Jesus, because Jesus finished the life we should have lived. He did it. He completed it, and then gives it to us. And if you think you can add to it, or you think you need to add to it, if you you end up thinking, I've I've just got to top up Jesus' life with my own good works. I've got to go to church or donate my money or tick off a checklist of commands or pillars to finally live the life I should have lived. Then there's a problem. It's, It's a problem because either you have a high opinion of your good deeds, thinking they somehow can reach God's perfection, or you have a low opinion of what Jesus did. And either way, the impact is disastrous. You'll find yourself in a never-ending treadmill, one that only brings pride or despair. But Jesus' life, it doesn't need any top-ups or additions. You don't need to soup it up or give it a polish. The life we should have lived, Jesus finished it. And that completed life covers over our endless craving for success or popularity or recognition we can seek. The, The Christian Christian can be different. She doesn't need to always be craving the boss's approval or or the parent's word of encouragement because she has a finished life, one that is clear and before her heavenly father, one that speaks the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We are free in Christ. 
The life we should have lived, Jesus finished it. But also the death we should have died, well, Jesus finished that too. There's not just a life we should have lived, we also know there's a death sentence, a a punishment for our rebellion, a death we should die, a guilt that sits over us. But again, again, let's come to the cross. Because after uh, Jesus died, John gives us clues as into what's just happened as he carried on. And it's, it's about legs being broken. Now that might sound a bit strange, but the way people died on the cross was normally from not being able to breathe. To breathe, you had to lift yourself up by, uh, uh, either by pulling on your hands or by pushing on your feet. And so when the pain got too much, you couldn't breathe. So to make people die faster, the Romans would, would break your legs so you could no longer push up, and so you'd die quicker. It's pretty nasty stuff. But when they got to Jesus, they found he'd already died, probably exacerbated by his extra floggings, and so they didn't need to break his legs. Just to make sure he was dead, a soldier shoved a spear into him, probably right into his chest cavity, shown by this flow of blood and water. He was dead. But John points again to fulfillment. Verse 36, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. Now, what is that about? Well, if you have a look just at the, at the beginning of the quotation, you might see a little A in your Bible, and that points to a footnote at the bottom. And we see this is a scripture reference from Exodus 12 and Numbers 9. And those passages, what are they speaking about? Well, they're speaking about the Passover lamb. They're instructions about how the lamb uh, that was used during Passover should have their legs intact. In other words, that the lamb should be without blemish. But notice, once again, John is pointing us to the Passover in understanding Jesus' death. He does this a lot during the retelling of Jesus' life and death. You might have spotted it. But Jesus is the, the fulfillment of that Passover lamb. If you know the story of the Exodus, you'll know that lamb was, was killed and the blood was put on the doorposts uh, of the Israelites' houses while they were in Egypt. And then when the destroyer, God's angel of wrath, came through the land, rather than dying, the Israelite firstborn children were saved. In other words, that little lamb died so that the Israelites didn't. It somehow bore, bore the wrath of the destroyer instead of the human being. How can a lamb stand in the place of a human? Well, it's because the true lamb of God is Jesus. Jesus is the one who takes the wrath of the destroyer instead of other human beings. He's the one who averts it. It's his blood that covers us, that shows a death has happened that appeases God's wrath. How? Well, remember those words of of John the Baptist at the beginning of John's gospel. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He can avert God's anger because he bears our sin. Because our rebellion goes on him. Our sin lands on him. He takes it onto himself as our our representative, as our substitute. And so bears the full weight of justice. He, He laid down his life for his sheep. He died for us. It was our sin that put him on the cross. It was our agonies that drove him there. It was the death we should have faced. So swap him for us, a substitute, Christ, instead of his people. He laid down his life for us, no greater sign of love, no greater moment of sacrifice. And we, we see this kind of sacrifice in books we read, films we watch, people dying to save another, but, but here it's deeper and it's real. It's not out there, not in the stories, it's for us. For us here tonight, even after Jesus had witnessed the extent of the sin he was going to face, he he went to the cross for us. God is always a God of love and also of justice. Something hardwired into us, isn't it? The desire for justice. We see it in our kids uh, when they they shout, that's not fair. We see it in our anger as a guilty person gets off scot-free. But here we see God upholding justice while lovingly saving his people. Sin is never just ignored. He always punishes it, and so for his people. In God's inexhaustible love, our representative took it. Not only was his life lived for us, but his death was died for us. And Jesus said, it is finished. 
it is finished. That death he died, it, it dealt with it all. Jesus finished the death we should have died. He completely dealt with all our sin before God. He bore the weight of human lives that were turned against God. And so every single sin that his people did, every single one, those against God, those against each other, those against ourselves and creation, they were taken. No sin too big, no sin too small. That sin that haunts your conscience, he dealt with it. That attitude that was so offensive before God, he dealt with it. Our whole rejection of God's taken as far as the east is from the west, it's gone. And so the wrath that sits over us has been born, completely taken. The punishment has been meted and met. All of it. We're free. So hell literally has no say over his people. The gates of hell have not prevailed against him. He's marched in and taken his people out. The gates lie bent and wrecked on the floor. Death is not the ending it once was. It is defeated. It has lost its sting and its fear. There is no impending doom that waits on its other side. The wages of sin are death, but with no sin there is no eternal death. For joy of joys, a house is prepared for his people. And so the devil is defeated. The accuser has been stripped of his power. His days are done. His end has come. He has been overthrown. It is finished. It's a cry of victory. Listen to poet S.W. Gandhi. He said this. He, hell, in hell lay low, made sin, he sin o'erthrew, bowed to the grave, destroyed it so, and death by dying slew. What a victory. What a dismantling of everything bad in this world through entering uh, the darkness to its depths. And it's for us. It's a gift for us. Listen to Matthew Henry. Come, come and see the victories of the cross. Christ's wounds are your healings. His agonies, your repose. His conflicts, your conquests. His groans, your songs. His pains, your ease. His shame, your glory. His death, your life, his sufferings, your salvation. What a savior we have. It is finished. And so there's nothing more to be paid. We can't pay more. God doesn't and won't seek any payment from you. He will never say, I sent Jesus, but you actually need to suffer some extra because your sin was so bad, or you, you need to pay me off by clocking up some good deeds. No, Jesus finished the death we should have died. You know, sometimes we try and punish ourselves further. We want to harm ourselves to make up for our sin, whether physically or mentally. We deprive ourselves or, or think we deserve bad things. But child of God, let Christ's death pay. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he took those nails and suffered being forsaken by God and he said it is finished the life we should have lived he finished it and the death we should have died he finished it this is why Good Friday is good at the heart of it all if it's finished it means we can know God we can stand before him we can know him as our father we can come before him forgiven by the death of Jesus righteous in the life of Jesus we're not searching for God anymore our hearts are not restless or seeking something to show us what life's all about. Our soul isn't floundering or drowning. We're no longer anxious to find meaning or worried that we might not have done enough with the time we've been given. J.C. Ryle puts it beautifully. We rest our souls on finished work. We know God because Christ finished the work given him, the life and death. And the way he did it means we approach God rightly. God's way of doing things puts our hearts in the right place before him. We don't stand before God or before one another puffed up in pride. Do we looking down on others? No. I didn't live the life. You didn't live the life. Jesus did. It's his righteousness. 
but nor do I lie as a slave, coward into submission, worthless before him and others, beating myself up. No, we have dignity in our humility. God so loved us that he sent his son. Christ did this for me, for you, his treasure possession. We know God and we come to him in humility and dignity. And if it's finished, then we'll know him forever. Nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. It's finished. The life has been perfectly lived and our sin perfectly dealt with. What else is there for him to do? No future sin will ever separate you. Not even death can separate you. That's a sweet word this evening, isn't it? His salvation is total. It's forever. It's everlasting. The perfection of salvation is found in Jesus. And that means as we live our lives from here on, God, God's not perfect, uh, expecting perfection somehow from you. No, he longs for us and works towards us being more and more like Christ. He wants us to live in righteousness, not just be covered in it, but he, he knows the sin that is to come. And he still sent his son to die for you. There are no shocks or surprises for him. Our sin is actually worse than we ever realize. But his grace is always far greater. We can know God forever. If you've never come to God for forgiveness, trusting that Jesus' death fully paid for your sin and you've never come to him for life before, trusting in Jesus' full life for you, then can I urge you to do so this evening? Jesus says, all who come to me, I will never turn away. Come to him this evening and find forgiveness of your sin, freedom from death, the death it deserves, a righteousness you could never earn, all so that you might know God himself forever. Your maker, the one who made you to find life in him. And if you're already trusting in Christ, may tonight be one that deepens our love for our Savior. May it draw out deep wells of thankfulness from our hearts. As we come to the Lord's table this evening, may we rest, rest our weary souls in Christ's finished work. And may we begin more and more to live lives of humility and dignity, lives of freedom, forgiveness of others and peace, lives that reflect the reality that the life we should have lived, the death we should have died, well, for us, Christ says, it is finished. In his name and to his glory, amen.